Hello, dear listener. Welcome to the Future Seeds podcast. I'm your host, Cyprian. And in this show, I explore groundbreaking solutions to our world's unique problems by connecting seemingly unrelated fields such as technology, ecology, community, and spirituality. The speaker for this episode is Helena Norvik Hodge. She's the founder and director of Local Futures, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the revitalization of cultural and biological diversity. In 1986, she was awarded the Right Livelihood Award for preserving the traditional culture and values of Ladakh against the onslaught of tourism and development. In 2011, she produced and co-directed the award-winning documentary film The Economics of Happiness, which lays out her arguments against economic globalization and for localization. And in 2012, she received the Goy Peace Award for her pioneering work in the localization movement. The book Wisdom for a Livable Planet profiled her as one of the eight visionaries changing the world, and the Earth Journal counted her amongst the world's 10 most interesting environmentalists. Good afternoon, Elena. Good afternoon. I'd like to start with a very basic question. What is Local Futures? Local Futures is an organization that I started. And I started the organization, well, well, really 43 years ago, but it had a different name. But essentially, it's, it's the organization I started then, and it grew out of the work that we were doing in Ladakh and also in Bhutan. So... <coughs> Uh, I've read about the work you do in, you did in Ladakh, uh, but you grew out of there, and now Local Futures is doing m much more than what you used to do in Ladakh. Yeah, yeah. And you have this whole moving from globalization to localization. Yeah. Could you explain a bit w how you define globalization, how you define localization? Yeah. Now, globalization is a word that was brought in as part of a process of deregulating global banks and corporations. And it was a series of free, so-called free trade treaties. And what these trade treaties were doing was giving more freedom to global giant corporations that were operating globally, you know, usually manufacturing where labor was cheap and selling where labor was paid better. And so these giant corporations were pressuring governments to give them even more freedom. And that's still going on today. And it's a process that I personally witnessed, you know, very closely um, the destructive impact in Ladakh and Bhutan. These were both parts of the world that hadn't been colonized. And because of that, they hadn't been impoverished because colonialism and slavery created a lot of poverty, driving people away from self-reliance into huge monocultures to produce for these global traders. So seeing in these cultures there was no real poverty, there was no such thing as unemployment, and 99% of the pollution we have today also didn't exist. And I witnessed year by year the impact of the global economy in destroying the local economy. So ever since that time, I've been promoting localization instead of continued globalization. And uh, I'm, I'm very concerned that right now most people have no idea that these trade treaties that are still going on to give global banks and corporations more freedom contain clauses called ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, where governments are signing in black and white, we promise we will not do anything that might reduce your profit-making potential. So that means if a country wants to increase its minimum wage, if it wants to reduce pollution or protect its forests, not allowed to do it. So we're talking about a very, a very dangerous situation. So I really think people need to know about that, and they need to know that this process of strengthening global production and trade is the reason for climate change. Um, and it's really by understanding that system, we would see that it would be relatively easy to reduce emissions in a geometric way by looking at the relationship between our national governments and global deregulated corporations and looking at what we call insane trade because countries are importing and exporting literally the same product 
butter, milk, beef, wheat, rice, importing, exporting. And very often it's the same quantities that are being imported and exported. Madness. And it's, it is madness. So, we, you know, we call that insane trade. And uh, when we also realize that on top of that, you have routinely in the global food industry, dominated by global corporations and global investment, you have at an ever-increasing rate the madness of scallops flown to Tasmania to China to be, to mm. be peeled, macadamias from right here flown to China to be cracked open, flown back again, shrimp flown from England to Thailand to be peeled, fish from Norway to China to be deboned, flown back again. So there's absolute insanity of enormous amount of transport, refrigeration, plastic packaging happening to suit the needs of very, very wealthy businesses to become even wealthier. And this process is there is massively increasing emissions, massively increasing resource use, massively increasing also water use, while marginalizing more and more people, creating job insecurity, financial insecurity. So the widening gap between rich and poor and the massive increase in environmental problems are completely linked in the global economy. When you understand what that means, and when you start instead promoting a process of localizing, meaning let's look at shortening distances, let's look at how we might reduce the number of miles that things travel in order to reduce emissions, reduce packaging, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and by doing that, supporting millions, if not billions, of farmers and smaller and medium-sized business. So localizing is about that process of shortening distances, reconnecting production and the middlemen and the consumers into more human-scale networks. So that's what we, in Local Futures, promote. That's what you promote. OK, I understand. So massive economical and environmental advantages to localizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, through Local Futures, you do that through conferences, books, movies. Is that right? Yeah, so we've been, we've been doing, we've been promoting this through lots of public speaking, books, articles, films, and conferences. We find conferences a very good way of trying to get people in a region together to become exposed to this paradigm that most people are not aware of, which is tragic, you know, what's going on in the global economy. And they don't even know that there is this really rapidly growing and quite powerful localization movement growing around the world. But because people aren't looking through those lenses, they're not quite aware how significant those changes are, and they may not even know that it's happening. You, you just, so. just last weekend, came back from the New Kind Festival in Tasmania. Uh, how did that go? New Kind is also trying to promote something similar, a more holistic approach that brings together both social issues and environmental. And it's very encouraging. A lot of young people, a lot of interest these days. So I'm feeling that we may see a very dramatic wake up, a sort of aha moment in the activist movement uh, to realize that there's a way that we can link voices. We don't have to become one organization. We don't even have to directly collaborate. But if we can be singing to the same hymn sheet, mm. we can help to both spark community initiatives, helping people move away from the I. I'm to blame. I have to stop driving my car. I can't get into a plane. I must do this. I must do that. People are feeling very overwhelmed. And we're trying to encourage people to change the I to a we to link up with people in the area where they live. Could be in the big city, it could be in a smaller town, but link up with some like-minded people and start looking at what can we do. And there we're giving them the tools to see that supporting community building, local economy building, and as part of that, a reconnection to nature, to the living, 
life around us to the plants, the animals, and the human beings around us. As, uh, as we start localizing, that's what happens. We reconnect. And so it's very, it's very healing. It's very psychologically and spiritually rewarding, as well as practically uh, beneficial and in, in a very meaningful way, because you can actually, once you start getting the gist of it, you can actually see you can have more jobs, you can have more money in the local economy. Uh, and that is a huge benefit these days. Yes, yeah, so it reminds me of two speakers that were at the Economics of Happiness talk in Barn Bay last year. Uh, one, I don't remember the name, but he presented the Repair Portland uh, project. Which it was pretty amazing, it touched me a lot, uh, where they rebuilt community by investing in intersections in the town. Yeah, that's in, in Portland. We started promoting localization in the early 90s, and Portland has been one of the leading places. They've done a lot in terms of local food and, and this city repair project. You know, they used intersections in the town and started painting them and creating convivial spaces for the community there. And so and it it's worked? a real statement. Yeah, it worked as part of a whole movement of many different things happening together. Yeah. Right. And, the other and it's not enough, you know, there's still constant pressures also in Portland. And this is why we, in our organization, in Local Futures, we recommend that people look both at what they can do at the community level, you know, connect with some like-minded people, and start both rethinking and re-educating themselves to see more clearly what's going on, and then also help to get the word out. So doing podcasts like you are, or just sending out an email to a few people can be really, really helpful to help build up a movement where, broadly speaking, those connected with social justice and social issues and those connected with environmental issues can be pressuring for the same policy change. Totally Because we agree. do need policy change. Momentum. Yeah. Um, the other speaker that it reminded me of it was Michael Schumann, who did an excellent talk about local economy and how effective it was even in terms of business, in terms of finance. Yeah. Yes, Michael is one of the first economists. I've, I've worked, I think, with yeah, the two first economists in the world to take local really seriously. One in England named Richard Dalfwaite, who unfortunately is dead now, and Michael, who early on understood the importance of decentralizing or localizing. So he's a, you know, he's a trained economist and lawyer, and has been an amazing spokesperson for, for localization. And he's a key member of our international alliance for localization that Local Futures is setting up, you know, an international group. That's also, some people can't quite understand why, if we're promoting localization, why are we global? Well, <sighs> we for a long, long time have been saying we urgently need to get the word out to build up much stronger movements around the world. Uh, so we are very proud of being the only organization we know of in the world promoting localization globally. <laughs> that is a bit funny when you say it like that. So in terms of, you spoke in terms of economy and in terms of environment, and, but I think you also advocate the transformation of agriculture, you know? Yeah, well, actually for me, if we think about the economy, what is it? The economy is how do we use nature and people to meet our needs? So agriculture is absolutely part of the economy, but most people see it as a separate category. We shouldn't. Um, and when we look honestly at what's happened to agriculture, we will see that it is the most important lever to bring about really fundamental and rapid change. So first of all, in the modern economy that we have today, which has been developed over several hundred years, destroying farming and destroying self-reliance was fundamental. What was brought in was this principle of comparative advantage. And the message was, don't produce the things you need for yourself, just specialize for export and then you'll be better off. 
on the surface, that sounds quite good. Well, you know, if you can grow oats very well in Scotland, well, just do that, and then you can import everything else you need. Mm. But we have to remember that these ideas came in at the same time as colonialism and slavery, and that all the time there were these global traders that were gaining huge amounts of wealth and power by creating that dependence on global trade mm. on both sides of the divide. Still going so, on. I remember in the 1950s, Africa was recommended to buy Asian rice, and now they don't. Produce enough rice for Africa. Yeah, absolutely, and it's happening all around the world, and uh, so it's it's a very tragic, fundamental, you know, foundation of the modern economy that needs to be questioned, and it needs to be questioned particularly by people who have some ecological literacy. So I talk about eco literacy, meaning both economic literacy and ecological mm. literacy. We need both desperately, and then. One of the best areas to look at if you want to become eco-literate is food and farming because it's so clear that as this modern economy started invading places around the world, what was pushed for was this, the fundamental thing was producing for export rather than for your own needs. So it's destroying self-reliance and in insisting on focusing and specializing, it was pushing monoculture. And monoculture from the very beginning, from cotton plantations to sugar plantations to tea plantations to wheat monocultures, have always been destructive and less productive than diversified farming. So if you take any two pieces of land in a one acre and you do monoculture on one and diversity on the other, you will always be able to produce much more with diversified production, always. But ideally, you would also have more jobs. You would have more labor on that land. Then you could produce vastly more while also increasing job opportunities. And because you're talking about diversified farming, you're talking about much more enjoyable jobs. If for farmers, it's not <laughs> as practical to collect a harvest than, than mon monoculture is. Well, you see, that's, that's right. If you have a monoculture, then you've got what's happened, which is pushing people into big cities, using more and more fossil fuels to do the farming. And the cities are very energy intensive, very polluting. So it's a highly inefficient system. And it's a system that's driving up emissions as we speak. Mm. And this urbanization is going on, you know, massively in places, well, you know, what we call the third world, but it's continuing in places like Australia, like Sweden. Jobs are being concentrated in fewer and fewer cities, and people who want to have employment are forced into more and more inhumane conditions. Even in the modern world, it's, you know, it's conditions where the house prices are so high, you're under intense pressure. Many people having to work 80 hours a week. It's disastrous for humanity and for the resources. So what we're talking about with localizing is reversing this towards starting to strengthen smaller towns and cities that remain in balance with the land around them. And so you're, we're encouraging farms in the region supplying for those towns and cities. And we're encouraging, you know, to rebuild many more jobs and livelihoods, even in villages and, and on the land. So it's beginning to happen, and it's happening partly because people who've lived the sort of typical uh, successful life in the city, many, I would say probably the majority, after a while develop a thirst for connection to nature and community. Mm. Because the amazing thing is, in these cities, because they're created by external forces, by business interests far away. So they're pushed into these cities dependent on those distant institutions, not on each other. So you're suddenly thrown into cities where you're not interdependent, there's no real community, and you know it's abnormal to even look people in the eye and say hello. And so it's completely unnatural conditions. 
Whereas in the more traditional local economies, people were dependent on each other. They knew each other. They looked each other in the eye. They were there also to support each other when needed. Um, so the, the localization, the vision that we have is to rebuild relationships like that. Community, yeah. But I also want to point out that there's a big difference between the old local and the new local. The old local, where you still have communities that have never left the place where they are, and that have, are still in smaller towns or villages, mm. have for generations been marginalized. They've been told that they're stupid and backward. They've had power removed from them. And so people there are not particularly self-respecting or happy. What we're seeing in the new local is a completely different picture. We're seeing usually the initiatives are taken by people who, as it were, come back from the big city, who actively want a deeper, healthier relationship with nature and with community. And they are consciously and actively rebuilding those relationships with vitality, energy, and enthusiasm. But not in the way of like what we call an intentional community, not like that. More in well, I, many of them are trying to build intentional communities, like eco-villages and so mm. on. But I guess in terms of what we promote, having had a lot of experience with this, because I was a, a founder of the Global Eco-Village Network, oh, which supported eco-villages around the world. Yeah, And so we've worked a lot with that. And I would say, generally speaking, they may not be the best way to move forward and to have much larger sections of the population start mm. localizing. And it can be, what I also learned from Ladakh and Bhutan is that, you know, people often talk about it takes a village to raise a child. Mm. Well, I discovered it takes a village to plant a field, it takes a village to harvest a field. We, mm. those eco-villages that have been created in the West didn't have an awareness of the need for more people, more people per unit of land, per unit of work. Yeah. And so it's probably easier, the mm. easiest place to start is probably in small towns. But there's also a lot happening inside big cities. Right. I was lucky enough to get, uh, to spend a week in a Karen village in the hills of Thailand and did the rice harvest with them, with all the villagers. And everyone comes to help one family, and then they switch to the next field, yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, thank you, amazing answers. Uh, do you think, I have so many questions, and there's so much to unpack, but do you think you've seen an obvious change in the world in the last 10, 20 years? Yeah, I mean, I, well, you see, I've seen, I've seen very dramatic change over these last 40 years. And so when I started this work 45 years ago, Almost everybody in the environmental movement was in agreement that we need decentralization. So across the industrialized world, people having gone through this urbanization, seen the pollution, the alienation and so on, there was a strong demand for decentralized development and decentralized renewable energy instead of fossil fuels or nuclear power. And there was a great hunger for community. Um, but what happened is that well-intentioned people, I knew some of them myself, like Maurice Strong was a self-made multimillionaire from Canada, and his wife, his Danish wife, got him really concerned about the environment, and he then wanted to talk to his mates in the corporate world. So as more and more of these people got involved in being concerned about the environmental issues, and they started funding the environmental movement, not through evil intention, but mm -hmm. through an inability to see their own shadow, an inability to step back and look at the global picture. They ended up funding and starting to talk about symptoms. So the big meeting in Rio in 92, which was the sort of first really global environmental conference, mm. which Morris was the one who organized, was suddenly switching everything to talk more about symptoms not about decentralization, no word about decentralization. And instead, what came out of that was the idea, well, in the global south, they must, of course, have growth, they must have development, but it should be sustainable. So partly through lack of consciousness and maybe partly through conscious 
ways of wanting to maintain their profit making while still showing concern for the environment. The corporate influence on the environmental movement meant that by the uh, from the 70s to about the mid 80s, which is right when globalization took off, a new form of globalization, uh, things shifted to treat symptoms and a more and more narrow perspective. And the, the voice for decentralization was no longer there. Yeah. And now I would say since 2008, there's been gradually more awareness about the need to regulate global banks and corporations mm -hmm. and more talk again of decentralization and just yeah i would say probably in the, yeah every year i suppose in the last decade there's more and more happening and above all you know what's happening is that many environmentalists who were just focused on protecting the forests protecting the seas are now looking at focusing on the economy, and that's vital. Because the economy is what unites the social problems with the environmental problems. That's where we have the potential to really reduce or eliminate most of the problems we have. And if we don't focus on the economy, the very worrying thing is that people who are being marginalized are becoming more and more frustrated, more and more angry, and they're also frustrated by um, what they see as heavy government regulation, which is true. It's partly brought in by big business. And so when leaders come along and say, forget about all this climate business or forget about the Amazon, we're going to grow the economy for you. We're going to make your nation great. We're going to make you great. People are voting in that direction. Mm -hmm. So we are, get jobs. we are now in a... You know, in a situation where we have to be as worried about fascism as we are about climate change. And again, by having a focus on the economy, understanding the global economy better, we have a chance to address both. But it's getting very urgent. And it's, it's made worse by new technologies, I think, and we'll get to that a yeah. bit later in the interview. Uh, through my recent interviews, I've few of those speakers interviews told me about the, the changes they can see in the business world, the corporate yeah. world. So some good news, fossil fuels are not being funded by this or that big corporation, this or that big company switching to electrical. Um, and it seems like even uh, Wall Street people seem to be reacting a bit with uh, some important text that binds them being rewritten, rewritten uh, and the Sustainable Development Goals framework that was published by the UN seems to announce good news. Uh, you nodding your head, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Well, I'm afraid that all of those things that you're talking about are not addressing the... The root cause. The root cause, yeah. and, and again, therefore, from my point of view, they're not holistic enough. Mm. And they're not holistic enough to include an understanding of what's been happening in the so-called third world, what has created poverty. Mm. So the sustainable development goals, I'm afraid, don't address that in any way. So it's really more of the same, but with nicer language. And so we've got to be, we have to be aware that there's a tragic combination now of over-specialized thinking linked to larger and larger scale economic activity and so it's very easy to be quite idealistic, quite green, and be in the UN, be in uh, national government, or in big business, and think you're doing the right thing. But So it's really up to people who are closer to the ground to start understanding how this dominant system works, to articulate much more clearly why we need to go in in a so, fundamentally different direction. In order to make that visible, I think you will if I say this, I know that the biggest cargo company in the world uh, is switching to electrical, their big boats, yeah. by 2040 or something like that. Um, let's imagine, let's imagine the whole world, all those big boats and all the airplanes switch to electrical. And let's imagine even, not gonna happen, but let's imagine, but by then we also have a totally clean energy. Yeah. Let's imagine all of that. Yeah. That's still not addressing the root cause and not good enough for your idea of localization because 
because if we want to survive, we have to start by that deeper eco-literacy, the ecological literacy, to really comprehend that the economy is the living earth, that every single thing we use comes from the earth, and that the earth is diverse, infinitely diverse. So this rich biodiversity requires intimate knowledge and care to help it survive. So what you're talking about there with plenty of energy and plenty of technology doesn't address that at all. It doesn't address the fundamental need for a closer relationship between human beings and the natural world. And for a closer relationship between human beings and that part of the world that they depend on for their food, for their clothing, for their shelter. So that fundamental aspect needs to be restored. It can be restored in a very new way. It's not about going back to the past. Mm. There can definitely be a room for technologies that didn't exist before. But we have to be very wary of the, um, the dependence on electronics and how energy intensive all of those tools are and how resource intensive. We really have to have an honest accounting Mm. Uh, where those minerals come from uh, and we have to have an honest accounting of why on earth on a crowded planet where there are too many people for the ideal situation why do we want to dump human beings and keep replacing them with very expensive energy resources and technologies why do we have doors that have to open electronically can't we use our muscle again to open a door can't we wake up to the fact that virtually every pesticide, every antidepressant is a technology that replaces people. And, you know, as a psychiatrist explained to me a long time ago from Harvard, he could see that now what was coming in was the pill and the drug, and he didn't possibly have time to deal with a patient to really understand their particular situation, the diversity of human and natural life requires that intimacy and care. So the human being who's feeling unhappy or is psychotic needs the care and the understanding from other human beings in order to set things right. Mm. But now the quick pill is there and the quick pill has all kinds of other often psychotic effects. The pesticides can easily be replaced by enough labor and when people are working on small, diversified yeah. farms, they actually enjoy the work. They're doing it in community. There is now a new farmers movement of young farmers around the world, even in the global south, even in Africa and India. There are now young people who would like to farm, but the dominant economy is making it very difficult for them to do so. But you know, making those key switches in the economic system what we tax, what we subsidize, and what we regulate. Mm. Right now, all of those are favoring global monopolies and destroying smaller and medium-sized businesses. So everywhere in the world, the place-based businesses are over-regulated and squeezed for taxes. And in the mm. meanwhile, the global players are deregulated, have no regulation, and don't pay tax. And right. then we're subsidizing the infrastructure for that. And funding whichever politicians they want to be in yeah, place. Yeah. Uh, fun games. <laughs> well, the, I, think, I think we need to remind the listener that the number of people who are still pushing to continue to deregulate or globalize, I would estimate that the active proponents of this would be maybe a hundred thousand people, mostly men. We're talking about vastly less than one percent of one percent of the global population. You know, the global really? population now is about seven billion something. So like seventy million people is one percent. There's no way in the world that seventy million people are actively pushing for further deregulation. That's an interesting it's a number. Vastly, vastly less. Now, there are many people who are going along with it because there's so much propaganda about this is what's going to benefit you. 
England has been subjected to three years of propaganda. How are we going to get the better trade deal? Europe or America? Europe or America? Better trade deal? Better trade deal? It's, it's horrific because there has been quite a lot of evidence and research showing how detrimental this absolutely insane trade is. Yeah, so the TAFTA was stopped, but the C CETA came through between Europe and Canada which is basically the same uh, trade deal that lowers regulations to lower standards for products to enter Europe. Um, yeah, so because generally speaking, the average environmentalist and social activist have not been paying attention to what's going on at that global level. And when I look around the world, I realize that it is extremely difficult because uh, unless you have traveled a lot and experienced a lot of different cultures, it's hard to see that pattern. So what you find instead is that people are desperately trying to protect maybe a forest near them or animal species or the poor or the, you know, the effects of violence and abuse. All of this, but not seeing the economic root cause, you know, because to see that you really do need to see it from a global point of view. If you don't, what happens is people are tending to blame themselves, they blame the other, they blame left or right politically, and they still maintain a faith in left or right, which is really counterproductive now. Mm. Because if you look back over the last 40 years, left and right have systematically gone along with the same economic direction. Mm. Again, because the economic literacy has not been there either at the grassroots or among the leaders. So let's speak a bit more about the alternative yeah. to this big system. Yeah. Well, the, the alternative to that big system is so clearly that we need at the policy level to first of all recognize we've got to move beyond left and right. Mm. We need to very click, clearly and quickly articulate the economic dimension and start identifying the fact that around the world, as people are trying to get elected, they will talk to the voter about their concerns, about jobs, about the environment. And then when they're elected, suddenly they don't seem to be listening to the voter anymore. But what they're listening to is the big money from the outside. And the big media, which then also is keeping essentially preventing us from having democracy. If we allow corporate-funded global media to determine the discourse, we don't mm. have democracy. So there's a, you know, it can sound difficult to take back the power, to take back democracy, but I believe that if there were more clarity and if the movements could start uh, coming together to articulate this economic agenda, we could see change very quickly. So the first thing I hear is structural, institutional change. Political change, but not a question of, let's write a letter to you know, our member of parliament. Mm. No, we can't now look at dealing with politics as usual. The way that we have to change politics is through people's movements that take back the power. And, Are and you that, talking about protest and activism? Or? I'm talking about, uh, if you haven't seen um, a movement in America now called Unbreaking America, you should look at that, it's very interesting. And it's similar to what a movement in Italy did, Five Star. I don't know if you know about Five Star. I know, but I'm French and like yeah. pro protests are a tradition in my country. Yeah, well in Italy it was a, there, first of all the remarkable thing is that no one has heard about Five Star. And that is because it was so threatening to the corporate system. Was, there's a comedian who said, there's no point voting anymore. Government's in bed with business, it's corrupt. We have to end the corruptions. We have to create a people's movement to take back the polity. And in six years, they built up a movement, and in six years, then went into parliament with 30% of the vote. Mm. They did it by going around the country and setting up local groups, and then they used the internet as their media platform. But unfortunately, they shouldn't have gone in that early. And the founder of it agrees, said, he told me that he also hadn't really wanted to go into parliament that early. Um, but there were a lot of young, enthusiastic people, very idealistic. And then they were also absolutely committed not to going into coalition. So they stayed there for about seven, six, almost six years or something, every day attacked by the media. 
every day, one way or your right wing, your left wing, your your anarchists, your this and that, and you know, really unfairly, because the commitment to society had been that they were giving half of their salary. Every member of parliament gave half their salary back to society. They set up a microcredit bank to do that. And when two members of parliament hadn't done that, they asked them to leave. Then the media shouted that they were anti-democratic. They said, how can you ask them to leave? They were committed to the voter, you know, the democratic vote. And they were doing what they had promised they would do. And that, so anyway, I was there. They used our film. You know, I know them quite well. But sadly, um, again, the younger people pushed to go into coalition this last time in the election. And they went in a coalition with a right-wing party in the north. and. Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I think one of the sad things was that knowing, as they did, I mean, certainly I met you know, some of the leaders, including the founder, and kept telling them, outside Italy, no one ever heard about them. And they needed to build alliances. I did not hear about it. I heard yeah. about Indignados. I heard I about Wall exactly. Occupy Wall Street. Exactly. I heard about the old Yellow Jackets, exactly. uh, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. And you heard about, um, what was it called, in Greece, because it yes, was much more mainstream know. left. You see, uh, what was it called again? But anyway, so they, that was much more, it wasn't systemic. It wasn't dealing with the systemic rot. Mm. And um, it is remarkable in this modern world where we think we're so well informed that even to the borders of France or Spain, or yeah, that area, close. people yeah. didn't know about it. And, and it's, you know, it's been around since about 2006. And, and it's still a very interesting phenomenon. And now Unbreaking America in, is saying similar things. And they managed also, they have Michael Douglas, the actor, and some other hmm. people now speaking for them. And so to me, it's a hopeful start. But I'm so hoping that there will be a clearer, again, eco-literacy that informs the movement, particularly if they do gain a lot more power. So, but, so OK, so and then I also just want to say that for me, you know, the, the knowledge that uh, what we need to do now and in the long run is to rebuild local economies. Mm. So right now, everything we do to support the local food movement is a step to reducing emissions, to creating more job security, creating more community, creating more happiness. So farms first. Local food. So the. One of the big problems is that people in food and farming, they tend to look at how are they producing. Is it permaculture? Is it biodynamic? Is it organic? Is it now very popular regenerative carbon sequestering, which is a very corporate language, by the way. Uh, so that, that focus is not productive. We need the holistic, systemic understanding. We need to understand we need to shorten distances to reduce energy and to reduce monopolistic control. And so therefore, we need to look at from the seed, what's happening to the seed and the soil, to the table, and the middleman, and the infrastructure that's needed for that. OK, the whole chain. Yeah, the whole chain. And that's what's starting to happen. And there's people who understand it are starting to fund this movement. And there's things like slow money in America, where mm. funders are willing to invest to help these things start, and realizing that if they get money back, some of them or, you know, not that attached to profit, um, that if there is any profit, it's going to take much longer to come back to them because they need to establish these new systems. And there's lots of financing, like what Michael was talking about, helping to finance this initiative. There's also community initiatives where people realize how important it is. And a group of 100 people sometimes put $100 each in to help mm. these things start. They do things also like when there's a community-supported agriculture scheme. It's still, because we're in this system where labor is artificially expensive and energy and technology is artificially cheap. So, What do you mean by artificially? Artificially, I mean that for generations, our governments have been subsidizing farmers to use fossil mm. fuels yeah, and right. technology. And all the time, and every step of the way, every business, every activity is being encouraged to use more energy and technology and to employ fewer people.
Mm. So relative to the technology, the human labor becomes too expensive. And so we're getting, so we can't afford ourselves. And it's completely linked to that everywhere in the world, local food will cost more, almost without exception, than food from thousands, even 10,000 miles away. Mm. And that's only possible in a manipulated economy uh, where if we were paying you know, in an honest economy, of course something from 10,000 miles away is going to cost more than something from one mile away. But that's, again, all these hidden, you know, again, how, what's taxed, what's regulated, what's subsidized, the has perverted the, the whole well. system. Yeah, but you see, the cost of the labor is, is being driven up, and that's why the local is so much more expensive. So the local, again, using a few people, becomes expensive compared to a giant farm that uses, you know, big machinery, lots of energy, well, and the using transport. Using a few Australians, more expensive than using a few Chinese. So uh, it, it, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. But it isn't just. It's not just that relationship between rich country and poor country. So, for instance, New Zealand butter costs a lot less in England, about a third of the price of English butter. Right. And so I've seen this all around the world. That's why, how my eyes were first opened to it was butter that had been transported for a week uh, over the Himalayas using lots of diesel and polluting, came into the local market selling for half the price of local butter. So that opened my eyes to what's going on. and. When I was invited to Mongolia, I found that there they have 25 million milk-producing animals. You couldn't even find Mongolian dairy in Ulaanbaatar. It was from Germany. In Kenya, Dutch butter cost half as much as local butter. And like I say, in England, and then you know Danish what? butter in Denmark, Danish, uh, I mean, um, French butter in Denmark, Danish butter in Spain. Uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. But you only understand it well. You start looking at it when you see it globally. When I would try to explain to English farmers how crazy the trade was, they said, oh, yeah, I know it's true. We export our milk to, to Belgium because they need to have the best milk for their chocolates. Or they will argue that, oh, yeah, it's because it's more efficient in New Zealand. That's why the butter here. You know, that's what they're told. But that's not the truth. The mm. truth is that global traders have got a hold of our, but see, global traders, remember, the economic theory that supported global traders has locked people into a mindset that keeps them blind to what's actually going on. Hmm. So I remember years ago I was speaking at the World Bank, and these economists were, when I was telling them about this happening with butter and so on in Ladakh, they were saying, no, 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 that's not supposed to happen, that's not supposed to happen. It is happening, <laughs> and it's happening again because of the ultimate, you know, consequence of this blind dogma about increasing trade and specialization, when uh, it's gone way, way over any kind of reasonable e level. Economically speaking, the holy grail is constant growth. So, yeah, in the new economy, how does that work? Yeah. If we stop this, this dogma. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of people have seen that constant growth is the problem. But unfortunately, if they don't understand this global, local dimension, I don't think they actually see, you know, the real problem. So, yes, constant growth, uh, you know, is, is ridiculous. Um, and more importantly, people need to be aware that what is growing is the wealth and the profit of fewer and fewer people. So it's become absurd that the human race is going along with a situation where day by day, you know, fewer and fewer billionaires control more wealth than half of the global population. Mm. And in, within every single country, the gap between rich and poor has been widening to absolutely obscene proportions. And yet the dynamic of it is not enough to just say, okay, we're not going to have uh, permanent growth. First of all, the growth doesn't measure growth. It measures breakdown. You know, mm. GDP goes up with commercialization. So it literally, if we pollute the water so badly, people have to buy it in bottles. That's good for GDP. 
If people have more and more cancer and have to have chemotherapy regularly, that's good for GDP. Mm -hmm. If you decide to stay healthy and plant a garden, that's unpatriotic. It, GDP will go down, will that's suffer. bad for GDP. Yeah. So the, first of all, the measure doesn't measure growth. And to the extent that it's being pushed, it makes a few people usually outside of your country wealthier. So the US policies have been creating billionaires in China while impoverishing the majority of Americans. Mm -hmm. right. So again, without seeing it globally, I feel like we miss the totality of the picture. And without that, it's also much more difficult to imagine how to create, systemically, how to create a healthier direction. Systemically, right. <clears throat> and so, again, the alternative, there is a new economy movement. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us about, about what's happening in that movement? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's wonderful that there are many of them. And, uh, and by the way, again, I feel we, we shouldn't be, uh, find it a big problem if various initiatives are not all linking hands. It's more, I think, very important that we share a vision and that we can try to get a holistic understanding out. And so it's really nice to have been part of lots of new economy initiatives, particularly starting in America. Um, there's something now called a new economy coalition there. there. Also, we were part last year of a, something called a well-being alliance. We all, that initiated in England, but also goes over to America. Um, you know, here in Australia, there's a new economy network called mm. NINA. Uh, and people, people like David Suzuki, who is on our advisory board, he told me a few years ago that you're right. I think if we don't focus on the economy, we're not going to make it. And so more and more environmentalists are also realizing that the need to... So what's happening in those movements? So what's happening in those movements, the important thing about them is that they're raising awareness. Okay. But to the extent that they're starting to get involved with action, some of them, uh, from my point of view, are unwittingly, by not looking globally enough, and therefore not looking at how to stimulate smaller scale, human scale, more local economies, they often end up just focusing on supporting impoverished or marginalized communities to start a business and to do better. But they don't realize they're not changing the basic parameters of what allows a business to grow or not to grow. And so without linking up the consumers and the middlemen and with you know a, a broader base, it's hard to, to actually create something that will be systemically beneficial. And that would help you know, literally millions, billions of people to have a more secure livelihood and to have a more sane, a more human scale, visible, accountable economic structures. I feel this kind, I keep having those talks, and I, keep, I feel this kind of a cognitive dissonance that happens when, when it gets too complex. So this, yeah. you, those systems are complex, you have to look at a lot of elements in the chain. Yes. And that's why people, oh, that's, that's in the too hard bucket. Yeah. And so it's yeah. easier to look at this little portion yes. and make a whole theory around that, that yeah. little portion. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I feel very frustrated because I feel like the global perspective that we have, which by the way, I am not alone in um, being committed to, although there are very few. There are very few who are still working with it, but like a friend of mine started the Décroissance movement in France, <laughs> Serge Latouche, you know him? And so he's had very similar experiences to me. He's about my age, slightly older. And he was in Laos and Africa and also saw communities that hadn't been mm. so colonized. And then so his whole vision for Décroissance is very similar, but he uses language that I think will not attract as many people. Um, and he's also more focused on just the critique rather than trying to focus on a vision. I totally agree that trying to understand that global system and even just using the word economy is quite alienating for a lot of people. And I've even had like real leaders, you know, spiritual leaders, um, artists and so on say, 
uh, well, I'm not an economist, you know, so even men, you know, will say that. Certainly most women say, no, no, stop talking about that. It just makes my head spin. So it's, it is very tricky, and I really believe that it's possible to create more materials with visuals, using moving visuals to try to explain these systemic differences. And I feel bad that we haven't done more of that. We intend to do it, mm. uh, and we really, really want to do it. But I hope you also look at our film, because our film tried to do that a little bit, but we didn't have the resources to do it as much as we'd like to. We'd actually like to you know, use a type of animation to yeah. To show, because we, we need to understand that we're operating in a monopoly game where the rules are so rigged that doing an ethical investment or an ethical consumerist act is virtually impossible. Right, that um, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, it's so corrupted and it's so, also so manipulative of our thinking and our choices because it's what I call you know, a drone economy where you don't even see the impact you're having. Or I talk about our arms being so long that we can't see what our hands are doing. So in that system, it's almost impossible to be responsible. Uh, so, yeah. so on a global level, and speaking more now about solutions, alternative, um, what do we need the most? Is it, is it educa education we're lacking? Absolutely. I would say it's education, but education about the real world. It's not schooling. Yeah. It's education about what's actually going on. We're completely misinformed in the industrialized, developed world about what's actually happening in the so-called poor countries. We're told, you know, we have everything. They're impoverished, have nothing. And people feel now guilty about being unhappy when the incredible impoverishment we've experienced is being cut off from community, having virtually no time, is so time poor, we've been cut off from nature, from the deep connections that make us human. We have been mm. dehumanized, and so we're deeply impoverished, but we're told we have everything, and so people feel terribly guilty about their unhappiness. They also now, on top of that, are told, you are the reason for climate change, and you are making life on the other side of the world for these poor people who have not contributed at all impossible. And you are the one who keeps persisting and driving your car and getting into a plane. And, you know, it's your fault that we have climate change. It's completely false analysis. It doesn't talk about the fact that government made arrangements with big business to take factories away from the industrialized world, move so much of the production to so-called poor countries, and with it, dramatically increase the ecological footprint, the CO2 emissions, massively, geometrically. No discussion of that. Al Gore said nothing about it as he announced the problem of climate mm. change. And so people are being you know, imprisoned in ideas that lead to a lot of self-blame and guilt. On the other side of the world, people actually have a lot more time than we do. They have more community. They mm. have more connection with each other and nature. But they are being marginalized. They're often now being put into these sweat factories to produce for us, not because we chose that. We didn't choose to have our jobs moved over there. Uh, but that uh, is not improving the quality of life there. But also, at the same time, they're being led to believe that we live in a paradise, that we really do have everything, and we do have community, we have mm. the amount of time that they have, and, and we live in a paradise, and they are stupid and backwards. My so. own uh, brother-in-law yeah. is a man that comes from the Lepcha tribe in Northeast India uh -huh. and was raised in Dharamsala in uh -huh. India. Mm -hmm. That's where my sister met him. Uh -huh. and now they moved to France. Huh. And he's discovering it's not exactly uh, he pictured it. Yeah, exactly. Very time poor now. Exactly, and you know the the uh, that information sharing. That's partly what we do. That's partly why we work internationally. And that information gap between less developed and very developed is huge. And for both sides, it would be very helpful to have much more exchange. I advocate for people to travel in order to understand better these things. If they care and they want to do something to make the world a better place, 
don't buy into the corporate blackmailing that says, oh, you shouldn't travel. If you're an environmentalist, how do you dare travel? We need to wake up to the fact that people who are pushing consumerism and pushing toxic chemicals and, and outdated and forbidden pharmaceuticals are traveling more than ever. And the people who are pushing mass tourism are traveling more than ever. And precisely the people who don't who really care and would like to try to do what they can to make the world a better place are now saying, no, 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 I can't travel. It's very, very unfortunate. Mm. So. Back to the topic of education again. Yeah. So education about what's really happening in the world. Yeah. Do we also need, do we also have now that the world's changed so much? Do we also now have a lack of skill and education on, you know, how to do permaculture or? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so the the beauty of localizing and you know and using technology where it really is helpful is allowing people to develop a multitude of skills not being trained as conventional factory schooling has done, trained us into learning nothing about how to grow food, how to build a house, how to provide for any of our needs during our entire school years, abstractions. And then if you want to learn to grow food, if you want to learn how to build a house, you go to college, an agricultural college, and learn about a basically corporate produced chemicals and technologies. If you want to become a doctor or healer, again, you go and you learn about pharmaceutical tools. Mm. And all of the monoculture, the same everywhere in the world, doesn't matter where you are. And if you want to build houses, yeah, you can become an engineer and learn all about what you can do with highly fossil fuel intensive toxic materials, including cement, steel, which they've now discovered that steel is much more vulnerable in fire than wood. So wood beams, thick really? wood beams are much safer in fire. They are very important. And um, so, I'll dig into that. Yeah, dig into that. It's in Germany, a German architect told me. Mm. And um, so the education has trained us for this over-specialized existence where people then end up forming their whole identity around that one job, that one function. And it's very deadening, and particularly deadening when people are losing their jobs left and right. So, yeah, localization allows people to, it's a, it's a path that allows us to slow down, because it's less technology-based, it's more at a human pace, human scale, uh, and, and allows and encourages people to develop much greater diversity of skills. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds uh, good. But you and, 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 you know, places like Byron Bay are sort of hubs for this kind of thing. But there are many, many hubs around the world. Mm. In every country you can find them. Yeah, it seems but like each country has those one or two of those big hubs. Yeah, well, or even more. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Technology. Yeah. There's a lot of big technology development at yeah. the moment. Yeah. Um, I was talking with this guy the other day. He's an engineer for a business that helps farms introduce sensors and drones to improve the farming. Uh, it's for a big tea plantation in Darjeeling, for example. And the, the pitch is that there's a lot of um, activities that require them kilometers of walking and uh, wasting a lot of resources and that sensors and drones will greatly help with that. So that's one example, and then you got all that massive research on energy, cold fusion, and hydrogen. And um, these are very specialized and very advanced technologies coming in. It's not like having your own solar panel, for example. It, it still makes you dependent on a lot of technology. And I think, I understand you're not against technology, you're against the dependence, right, that, that, that it creates. Uh. Well, I'm against technologies that now use scarce minerals and, you know, they're talking about mining the Mediterranean seafloor for minerals for electric cars and so on. So I'm, I think right now we need to be looking at technologies that enable and really enrich human life and that are also linked to spreading the wealth 
So rather than concentrating everything in larger and larger conglomerates that use vast technological systems to control both resources and humans, we want to look at genuine decentralization and technologies in the service of human scale structures. And we shouldn't be so afraid of people walking. We're waking up, there's another hole, there's a lot to say about this, but you know, in the industrialized world, every day we're learning more about how much we suffer from not moving more, from not using our bodies more. And again, with the time pressures, you know, most of our employment, we can't move. Let's think about that, maybe actually some ways of doing things where we do end up moving quite a lot, maybe even lifting a few things is not such a bad thing. And that it's a lot healthier than sitting in front of a computer. I heard you lose six years of your life if you spend your whole life working in front of a computer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I, I think it's going to end up being more than that because you, now we're discovering that the food we're eating as well is so bad for us and that in America for the first time, this generation is going to live shorter. Mm. We're also, you know, sugar, which is being pushed on the global po population by big business. From the very beginning, it was pushed by big business. It's a drug, and there are now people talking about that it should be banned, like tobacco. It should have a warning on it. And there's a doctor in Australia who's seeing the incidence of blindness going up very, very rapidly because of type 2 diabetes, oh. which larger and larger numbers of people are getting and that's because of sugar. So it's remarkable how many things are actually linked to allowing giant for-profit entities to dominate so much. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not about good guys and bad guys. You know, you can have really well-intentioned people working inside the biggest companies and they, you know, they can be a lot nicer than someone who owns a small independent business. It's about the actual structure and the scale of the impact and the accountability, I think. Which I think, for me, it's very nice to be able to advocate for something which doesn't have to demonize, doesn't have to blame you know, any particular group or any particular business, but rather look at, let's look honestly at what this is doing and what it's serving. And the system. How, yeah, and how can we change it? And also, that means looking at the smaller systems both as they existed traditionally and as they're being recreated in the new localization movement. And just visibly seeing all these benefits. You can literally increase productivity, increase meaningful job opportunities. So, I mean, it also means looking at the benefits of localization and really seeing and counting them. You know, we need a lot of funding to be able to do all that research. There's so much happening that needs to be researched, documented, and put out there. Mm. But of course, the small organizations like mine that work with this don't necessarily have the resources for that. But um, uh, you know, when you know that you can actually increase productivity from land while you simultaneously reduce the ecological footprint, there's also so much to document and make visible from the localization initiatives that are happening already, and so you have you know, evidence that we can increase productivity from land, increase productivity in forestry and fishery and farming, while simultaneously reducing, massively reducing pollution, restoring biodiversity, restoring meaningful livelihoods, many more livelihoods. It is such a win-win-win strategy, because also in that more human scale, diversified production, closer to the land, you're also rebuilding community interdependence. Mm. We're talking about restoring fundamental patterns in how we evolved as human beings. We evolved in intergenerational community. We evolved deeply connected to the plants and animals on which we depended. And that engendered a type of responsibility and a type of care that is absolutely vital. It's not a guarantee for that but it creates the conditions for very compassionate, caring relationships between human beings and between human beings and the natural world on which they depend. Love it. Love the vision. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to wrap up, so you have an event coming up, Going Local, 
in yeah. March in Byron Bay. Yeah. You want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, it's called Going Local in a Hope... It, Not local like crazy, yeah. local. <laughs> it's called Going Local Hope in a Time of Crisis. And we just think people desperately need to have access to this bigger picture and to know that there is this alternative path, this systemic direction that they can join right now with huge benefits. So it really can help remove a lot of the self-blame and the anguish that people are feeling right now and give them both a vision and practical tools for change. And we do have some voices from around the world. David Suzuki will be Skyping in, so Charles Eisenstein, and uh, you know we have a number of indigenous leaders from around Australia coming. So I'm very, I'm very excited about someone named Albert Wigan from the Kimberley. Um, so I really hope that people will think of joining us at the community center March 20th to 22nd. I'll be there. Good. Okay. I want to ask you very personally, why do you do all this? Why did you get into it and why now you're still in this battle, in this fight? I'm, I'm, I was so shocked and, and frightened in a way by what I saw happening in Ladakh and Bhutan, where I saw people who had lived side by side for 500 years. There had never been group conflict. And I saw step by step how the economic system created such fear that people were literally exterminating each other. And they felt fear for their survival. I think I, you know, even Buddhist grandmothers said to me, we have to exterminate all the Muslims or they're going to exterminate us. And this is what they'd been told by, by their teenage grandsons who were, had become so angry and so frustrated by what was happening. They'd been thrown into this intense competition that's what this dominant economic system does. It does not engender in any way real collaboration and interdependence. And um, I also saw that every step of the way, this system was increasing fossil fuel use and pollution. And so I realized there's no way to escape either climate change or violent war and conflict. So I just became very motivated to do what I could to raise awareness about the fact that there is a path towards nature, towards community that actually can work. You know, that's what both Bhutan and Ladakh demonstrated to me. There was just no doubt whatsoever that people mm -hmm. were happier and more at peace with themselves, with others, and with their environment. And I, you know, I realized that we can't go back and that we wouldn't want to go back because there are certain tools that we can use. And above all, what we have also gathered ourselves is a lot of information and news from around the world that shows that there's also a lot to learn from each other in terms of that path of, of localization. Mm. Amazing. So maybe now, 30 seconds, if you could look at the camera. Yeah. And if you have, you know, a message that's yeah. dear to you that you want to send to the world. Yeah. Yeah. I really hope that you will think of joining the global localization movement, which is a movement that's taking us systemically towards nature, towards community. We need to be eco-literate, aware of the fact that the economy, the economic system right now is taking us away from nature. And eco-literate is also ecological literacy. We need to realize that nature actually needs more people now to nurture back to life the very soil, the seeds that really are adapted and life-affirming. So there is a really positive movement out there that's a win-win-win strategy. So I hope you will join us. I hope you will look at our website, localfutures.org, to find a lot of examples of inspiring initiatives and something that will give you tools to get going today to join a really powerful and joyous movement. We call it the economics of happiness. Head to www.localfutures.org and together let's start from global to local. Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Thank you.
The Future Seeds podcast is a project that is supported by its community of listeners. If you like the show and what it stands for, I invite you to head to www.futureseats.news where you can support the show for just $2 a month, be part of the Future Seats community, connect with its amazing members and speakers, and enable this podcast to thrive. I thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the show and its exploration of alternative solutions to the world's greatest challenges.